Now we have our, <clears throat> pardon me, I was struggling a little with my voice tonight. We have our young ladies quintet. Is it a quintet? Ah, it's a quartet tonight. Okay, we're missing one. Qu quintet minus one. a little age check. The Lennon sisters have nothing on them. That's a Lawrence Welk reference to you people that don't even know who Lawrence Welk is. All right, Brother Huggins uh, called me one day, and uh, I didn't know who he was, never met him, and don't know anything about him, so I don't know how to give him a good uh, introduction. 
He told me he, his dad was Peter Ruckman. I said, okay, you can come. <laughs> so then I called back. I was supposed to call back and firm up with him, and I didn't do it Friday when I got the note. And then I called him this morning, and it said, I was, you know, Michael Huggins, missionary of Brazil. I said, missionary of Brazil, that's not the right guy, and I hung up. <clears throat> it was a recording. I didn't hang up on him. So then he called back, and I said, do you know me? He said, no. Do I know you? No. So where'd you preach? Where are you? No walk. Where'd you preach this morning? Nowhere. Where are you preaching tonight? Preaching for me. I said, okay, you're the right guy. <laughs> so uh, I'm really thrilled to have uh, Brother Huggins and his wonderful wife with us today. And they're going, I didn't know it, I just wanted to hear what he had to say. But they're going to be missionaries uh, to Brazil, or are missionaries to Brazil, working through the process. And I uh, don't know what he's going to do. And uh, I don't care because I know it's going to be good. So God bless you as you come, brother, and the pulpit is yours. All right. Very good to be here. Um, growing up as a church brat, I took being in church for granted. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the Lord does a lot of things in our life to get us in a place just like this. And if you look back over your life, there's so many things he did to get you here tonight uh, over a long process. And I, I like to start off with my testimony, as you heard. Um, I'm, my mom married my, my dad. I consider my dad Dr. Ruckman. He raised me since I was about seven years old. And my history goes back even before my salvation. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, he was a farmer and north of Pensacola, just a common regular man. He wasn't a minister, he just, he loved God. And they didn't have a church building to meet in. They had a community building. They had to share with the Episcopalians and the Methodists and all the other groups. They were only able to meet one Sunday a month. So he wanted to have church every Sunday and decided there was something he could do about it. So he donated a part of his farmland to set up a church building on. And they invited a pastor out from Alabama. He started preaching there and the church grew and, and, and thrived, ended up becoming a very big church there in Pensacola. And you fast forward from that time, almost a hundred years. And I'm a young boy, I'm about you know, uh, five years old there. And sitting in the congregation, I hear a, a preacher preaching and I couldn't tell you exactly what he preached on. He, I, from my view, I think he preached on hell because um, it did, it scared the hell out of me. I didn't want to go there. And that was something that, that I realized at that point, and I turned to my mom and said, Mom, what do I do? She opened her Bible to Acts chapter 16 and led me to the Lord right there in that balcony. Now, years later, probably 12 years ago, I was doing some family uh, history research and found out that that same church that I got saved at was built on the property my great-great-grandfather donated. And starting off telling you that, that story, letting you know God does a lot of things to get you in a place just like here tonight. And he does a lot of things for me. He does some work behind the scenes, you know, to get me to the point where I can hear the gospel. And that's a great blessing. And really that's, that's mission work when you look at that. Mission work is not about getting an instant result. Um, that's kind of our generation. We want, we want instant gratification. And most of the times the Lord doesn't work that way. And so starting off with that, hopefully that gives you a, a good idea of who I am. I met my wife. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you can see already she is a great help me. She's already got my slides up and ready and we're good to go. So um, we got married in 2008. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but if you take a look over here to the left, I'll give you a little bit of a view of Brazil. And Brazil is a, a unique place as far as that goes in the world. Um, if you're not familiar, it's in South America. It's the largest country there in South America. Um, Brazil itself, when you get into the history, was discovered in the 1500s by a man named Cabral. He was a Portuguese. That's why they speak Portuguese today. Now, they came over, and they came over with the religion. They came over with the Roman Catholic religion. And they instituted that, and that became basically the foundation of that country. And so much where they called the name of it the Land of the Holy Cross. That was their, one of their very first flags. And that was its name from that on. 
until eventually it got changed to Brazil. Now, since its beginning, its foundation was Roman Catholic. They ended up having all kinds of turmoil there. They broke free from the Portuguese empire, set up their own country in about 1822. That struggled for a while, about 1880s. They ended up becoming a democracy. They wanted to be like a country they considered was great. And guess who that is? They wanted to be like us. But sadly, you know, that's not the flag for Brazil today. And it didn't last very long at all. That, that democracy fell apart very quickly. And you say, why in the world didn't it work? They tried the Constitution. They tried all the election. They tried representation of the people. But it did not work. They had great resources, everything you would need to make a great, great country. But again, I just finished showing you why God didn't allow their country to be great. They started off with religion and Roman Catholicism. We started off very differently with God and the Bible. So you have a completely different outcome with a different foundation. So that gives you a perspective of Brazil, where they're at, what the people know. And that's all they know about Christianity is Catholicism. That's, that's what they, they live off of. Now Brazil itself is a large country. It's the fifth largest in the world by land mass and population. And it also uh, there, you see a picture there, that's Sao Paulo, about 22 million people there. Um, like almost all the rest of the world, they're moving out of the farmlands into the cities. That's very true with Brazil. Now about 82 out of 100 people live in the cities. I know you guys got bad traffic here, but they got it there too. It's, it's bad there in uh, the big cities. But talking about that, you know what happens when you pile people on top of people. It's, it's frustrating, right? It's aggravating. You know, you don't drive down rush hour traffic here and just, you know, praise God the whole way. Unless you're a super Christian or something like that. It gets frustrating. Well, with that, people end up doing things they shouldn't do and a crime end up happening a lot. And that's what takes place there in Brazil. There's a lot of crime. There's a lot of incarceration. It's the third highest amount of incarcerated people in the world. They have over 700,000 people in prison. Um, I've been able to do some prison work for the last about 20 years. And hopefully we have a contact there in Brazil. We'd like to do some more when we get there. So if you guys could pray about that for us. Now Brazil itself is the large country, like I said, fifth largest. If you look up in this area, it's what most people think of of Brazil. It's, it's Amazon. It's, it's rainforest. Now I say Amazon, everybody's waiting for that package in the mail. But it's, it's a different Amazon. It's hot. It's, it's, it's very wet. Uh, people don't want to live there. So they end up moving to the coast. Um, we'll be in an area about right here called Pulso Alegre. Um, Sao Paulo, the big picture of the city is right there. There's 22 million people. So it's a very dense area. A lot of people live in that area. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is only about five hours away and there's 12 million people there. Um, so it's a very densely populated area. Um, so that's where we'll be starting off training, learning the language, learning the people. I'm an American. I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about Brazilians. It's going to take us a while to fit in. So we're going to be doing that our first term there, working with them, and moving out as the Lord gives us light on where to start the next work. This part you've seen, I'm sure, you've seen people that live in poverty. Um, I think for us as Americans, it almost uh, tugs at our heart and gives us a little bit of guilt uh, because we know there's no reason why we should live so good and really the most of the world doesn't live anything like us other than God just blessing us. And that's what you have there in Brazil. One of their uh, serious social problems they have are these, they're called favelas, um, just shacks on top of shacks. They, they move out of the farmland into the city to get work and many times there's no running water, uh, no electricity, no roadway system, no police station, no hospitals. It's just mobs and mobs of people. And so it's a very chaotic place. Uh, the ones that really truly suffer the most that come out of that are the children that many of them get abandoned, many of them get abused, uh, neglected, and just about the worst kind of life you can imagine. And so they leave those areas and move to the city, to the center, and live on the street. And they start off begging, they start off doing what they can to survive, eventually they themselves get into gangs, um, get into just a, a terrible life. And unfortunately for them, the life expectancy there of those kids in Brazil on the street is only about 14 years old. 
So they don't live very long at all, either from disease, malnutrition. Uh, There's very, very much violence there. Uh, so you can see the condition. And you know what? That's not what God wants for them. The Bible said, Jesus Christ said, The thief cometh but to kill and to steal and to destroy. But I have come to give them life and to give it more abundantly. That's what God wants for them. And it's not to live in a mansion on the side of the, you know, the beach and that type of thing. The abundant life is in here. It's what Jesus Christ gives you in salvation. And that's what we would like to do with these kids. I grew up in a good life. I grew up in America. God's burdened us about reaching these kids that never had the opportunity that I had as a young boy to hear the gospel. So if you would pray for us about that. Um, that's a situation where it will be a lot of legal work, a lot of paperwork, a lot of things to get set up there in the country. So pray about that if you would. Those beggars are, are serious, but when you consider beggars, what's worse than begging for food? Well, begging for something spiritual. Begging for something uh, eternal. And many people come to a church building and they beg for really their salvation. And what happens to them? They leave there empty every time. And you say, what's the problem? Well, they're, they're begging at the wrong place. They're begging at religion. They're begging at Catholicism. You come to Jesus, He will not cast you out. But they don't know that. And so right now in Brazil you have a, a large portion of them are Roman Catholic, 65%. That number has declined since the 70s. It was 92% back then when it was a military dictatorship. Now the doors are opening for us. The Lord has saw fit to allow us to be able to be there as missionaries. But unfortunately we're getting beat out by all the other groups. Right now they're about 12% of that number of Protestants is Pentecostal. So they're really just as lost as they were when they're in the Catholic Church. So the Lord's opened a door and it's our job to go through it and get them the truth. And you say what happens? Well the Brazilians see in their church in Roman Catholicism they offer this. This is called votives. These are little wax body parts. Um, you can't really see it too well but that's a wax backbone, a wax heart. A wax hand there. Um, you see wax heads at that table, wax legs there at that other to the right. Those are called votives and they teach the people there in, in Brazilian Catholicism if you have an ailment in your body and you need some help. You come and take a pilgrimage to this certain cathedral that has these parts. You purchase that and you leave it there with the priest and then that priest prays over that. And in time if you have enough faith they say you get healed. Well, guess what happens in time when you don't get healed? Well, you come back and tell them I didn't get healed. They say, well, you need to take another trip and bring more money. So what does the Brazilian people do is they realize it's not about God being merciful. It's not about healing. It's not about getting help. But it's about a religion building a kingdom on this earth. As you see the poverty, you see the, where the riches are in the country. It's in the Roman Catholic Church. They have these ornate cathedrals all over the place there in Brazil. Our, our goal is a uh, hope I have this man here, Brother Joseph Domingos in 2002. I visited him, got to preach in several of his churches. Uh, the Lord answered a prayer for me back in that day uh, to see that I could get back to Brazil. Uh, but he did something. He postponed me there for a while, for almost 15 years, and did not want me to go back to Brazil. Uh, the missionary had an eye surgery. They put the wrong lens in his eye. And we canceled our, my next trip back to Brazil. The next year he had a scheduled surgery to get it fixed. They put the lens in, it was right, but it got infected. And then the last surgery he had to come back home to the States. And so the Lord showed me to, to wait on going back to Brazil. Now obviously I know why. The Lord wanted me to stay there in Pensacola and help out with my dad and the ministry there. That's what I've done for the last 15 years. Um, taught Sunday school to 7th and 8th grade boys. Uh, did nursing homes, did jail ministry, uh, taught in a Bible institute there. And those things the Lord was, was helping me get tools in my toolbox to minister to the Brazilians. And I needed that. I also needed a lot of help. And like I said before, the Lord gave me a great help meet. Uh, we got married there in 2008 and kind of a little bit jealous of my wife because we found out about three years ago she actually has family in Brazil. Um, she had her great uncle was a Roman Catholic priest that met a Roman Catholic nun there and they decided they loved each other more than they loved the church. So they got married. 
And so now we have family through my wife there in Brazil that we're looking to contact there when we get to Brazil. This last trip we took in 2016, we got to see some folks get saved. Uh, the lady here, her name's Andrelli. She was a church member's niece. They had been working on her to come out to service, and she came out that first night we were there. And those two young boys, Paulo and Gabriel, got saved. We had a special meeting the last weekend we were there, and the man in the middle here named Joe, he was a neighbor of one of the church folks. He got invited and came out and got saved that first night of the special meeting and came every night after that. Um, we had the last night we were there, the lady next to my wife named Bruna, uh, just one of the co-workers of the church people there. And she came out. Now, I show you that, obviously, to show you people are getting saved in Brazil. But also, very importantly for us as a church here, is that the, the Brazilian people were the ones getting those lost folks to church. And they were inviting their family members and their co-workers and their relatives and those type of things. And some of it took it a long time for them to get there, but they came and got saved. And that was a blessing. And so that was so what we see there in Brazil. Um, we also get to get out on the street, hold up scripture signs, pass out gospel tracts, um, doing some open air preaching. We got to see some folks get saved from that. There was a young man that heard the preaching right there. His name's Umberto. And Umberto wanted to know more about the preaching and came across the street and ended up getting saved there on the street corner. So that was a blessing to see him and then another lady, Sandra, get saved that, that day as well. Those things you consider, that's our purpose. Um, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I thank God somebody came by my way and led me to Jesus Christ. I'm glad somebody took the time out to do that and that's the will of God. And I think sometimes maybe you guys forget how big of a, a job you do here and how important it is. Missionaries cannot do what they do on the field without you. And you think sometimes I get up and go to work and what's the purpose of this? Everybody has their part in working and, and serving the Lord and making sure the light reaches the world that Jesus Christ wants to. And that's our job there. And we all have to fit together and say in our place there that's what you see as far as somebody's eternity changing. I know you guys have been supporting missionaries. Somebody's going to come up when you reach heaven. And they're going to thank you for the things you've done for them. And you don't even know who they are or where they came from. But you were contributing. You were helping out. You were praying. You were asking God to, to open up doors for those missionaries. And God's going to reward you in part with the missionary. And so just an encouragement to you not to be weary and well-doing. Even if it's a secular job, you're working for the Lord. And so that should be an encouragement to you there in that. Um, but really our work there in Brazil, we have a lot to do on a conservative number. There's over 184 million Brazilians deceived by their religion, dying and going to hell. So one missionary is not going to do it. Ten missionaries, 100 missionaries are not going to do it. Um, we need laborers to go to the harvest. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, he'll send forth labors into his harvest. Why? The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Always consider that, especially when you hear a missionary come through, say, Lord, what will you have me to do? What do you want me to do? Maybe a, a young person he deals with tonight about a mission field. Always be attentive to what the Lord would have you to do and consider that and ask him to show you. Now just closing that out. Um, talking about our goals. I'm sure you've seen these before and don't mean to be re uh, repetitive or anything like that, but really as far as uh, in Brazil, we need to learn the language and the culture. Like I said before, I'm an American. I don't think like a Brazilian. And if I'm going to relate to them, if I'm going to sit down and, and meet with them and talk to them, I need to learn more about them. Not just say, here's the truth, take it or leave it. And so that's our desire there is to learn their culture and also evangelize the lost. Right now, they're open to hearing the gospel. There's no guarantee that's going to last for a long time. So we want to get there while their hearts are tender. Um, also, sorry, train national ministers. Um, I'll tell you this, probably kind of seems backwards, but the best person to reach Brazilians is not an American. It's actually another Brazilian. And so we want to train those people to be able to reach their own and know how to deal with the things they have to deal with there. 
So we want to train the nationals. And the last thing there, um, establishing local churches. And like I said, when I started, I did not realize how important it was that you have what you have here tonight. And I know there's so many distractions this world throws at you. And there's every reason in the world not to be here when the doors are open. But the Lord wants you here. And the Lord does things for you when you come. I got saved in a local church just like this. I got right in a church just like this. I met my wife in a church just like this. And I realized the, the most important things in my life have happened in a place just like this. And I know that God has so much more for me getting in a place like this. Amen. Now you consider that. What, what would you do if you've never had a place like this? Yep. And that's where they're at in Brazil. They don't have a Baptist church on every corner that's preaching them the truth. And so we'd like to do that. Establishing local churches is a goal that I've learned even on deputation is very important. So if you would pray for us, we are the Huggins heading down to Brazil. And we do appreciate you guys uh, allowing us to come in. It's a blessing to be here. And Brother Mitchell uh, having us in, it's, it's, it's uh, always encouraging to hear stories about somebody that's been around my dad years back. It's always a blessing to my heart. So I appreciate you guys opening it up, allowing us to come in. All right, Liddy, if I could get that. Okay. All right, I thought about something for you. I know you've heard uh, some about Brazil. I know you've heard about what the country's like. You've heard a little bit about me. Um, but I know you didn't come really just to, to hear from me. I know you want to hear something from the Lord. So I hopefully have something here for you that will be a blessing to you. If you have your Bibles, if you would, open up to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And I don't want to be like Pharaoh and not let God's people go. So I know you have things you need to be doing. So I just want to give you something that may help you, encourage you. Um, I, I'm very aware that every time people come to church, they bring burdens. And they bring things that just... It's heavy on you. Um, like the pastor was, was telling me about my microphone when I came on. He said, just, just click that microphone on. They're not going to let you down. They're going to take care of you. And I think about that. It was, it was kind of strange because I was debating on uh, if I had some time what to, to talk to you about. And I was going to preach to you about being let down. And so I thought that's, that's the Lord using, using your pastor even given some direction for his people. So hopefully you'll get a blessing from this tonight. Um, Acts chapter 9. If you're familiar with the passage, it's Paul getting saved. Uh, he was a persecutor of the, the, the Christians there. He's coming down to Damascus. And he's coming down to Damascus. The Lord meets him there along the way. And he ends up getting saved. Now, he stays there in Damascus, and I'm giving you a quick overview of the chapter. He stays there in Damascus and begins to minister there for, for quite a while. Many people get converted and start following. Well, obviously the Jews, who he once was friends with and he was very close with, they turn against him and begin deciding, you know what, we need to kill Paul. We need to get him out of here. We need to execute and take him out. And they begin night and day trying to find a way they can kill Paul. Well, Paul's a new Christian. He's never been on this side of the story before. He's always been the persecutor. Now he's the persecuted. And everything at that point was all new. He had just gotten saved, just got his blindness removed from him. Everything in life, I'm sure, was so much better than it ever was before. The burden of sin is gone. But now something else has come in. And now he's looking at, I'm about to die if God doesn't do something. And you notice the passage, if you would, go ahead and look at uh, Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 23, and we'll make a few comments here and see if the Lord will um, minister through his word here tonight. Acts chapter 9, verse 23. It says, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But they're laying away who knew, known of Saul, uh, I'm sorry, 
but there lying in wait was known of Saul, and they watched through the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Before we get into the message here, let's pray. Lord, we thank for this day, thank for the opportunity to be with these folks. And uh, Lord, I know uh, every single one came here with a need, and I know I can't fill that. Only you can. We pray you'd supply all these needs here today, minister to your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you notice that in the passage, verse 25, it says, The disciples took him by night and let him down. Let him down. He got let down. And I know what the context is. I know what it's talking about there, but he got let down. There was something there where he was at a place where things were going differently, and then all of a sudden everything changed. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is the, the place that he was at. Where was Paul? Paul was in Damascus. Paul was in Damascus. When Paul was heading to Damascus, he was heading as a persecutor of the church until he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ knocked him off of his high horse and everything in his life changed. Everything in his life changed. And he, he got an answer to the thing he was looking for. Um, you mentioned, uh, you see that there in verse 3 through 6, Lord dealing with him personally. And the Lord opened up his eyes. The Lord gave him something. You know, when he saw that bright light, he was physically blinded. But spiritually, he could see better than he ever was before. Now, I don't know if there's a place in your life where God really met with you and he really dealt with you. And he really showed you something. And it may not be the place you got saved. It may be a place where, where you had a revival meeting or something like that. Or you had a dedication where you rededicated your life to serve the Lord. But that place is special, I'm sure, to you. You may remember the exact pew you were sitting in. Maybe it's in this building. Maybe it's in the building next door where the Lord convicted your heart and you got saved. That's a special place to you. Because you realize your eternity changed. Your eternity changed for once you were heading to hell and now all of a sudden God allowed you to head towards heaven. And that's a great place. That's something that you remember. And that place is there. And Paul had that place here in Damascus. Now things change there like I mentioned. You notice there was a, not only just the place that Paul remembered, but it was also the predicament that he comes across. And that predicament there was those ones, the Jews that he was once friends with there in 23, verse 23, now had turned against him and now they're his enemy. And they're going to move against him. And I don't, know, I don't know if you've ever had anybody stab you in the back. Have you ever had anybody that you've helped out and you've extended a hand to and you got them out of a mess and you know, a little bit later they're in there getting that knife into the hilt in your back? That doesn't feel good. That's painful. And, you know, that's what was going on there with Paul. Paul was there in that predicament where his people who were used to be his friends, used to be people he would line up with, have now turned against him and were his enemy. Well, you think about that. How many stories in the Bible, how many stories in the Bible where people got let down by a situation like that? Joseph, if you remember back in the Old Testament, Joseph was let down by his family. His family, his own brothers, they should have been siding for him. And you know what? They wanted to see him get sold into slavery. Now, your, your family may have done some bad stuff to you, but I don't think nobody's ever sold you into slavery here, right? But you know what? There are some, some sad situations that happen. There's some bad predicaments there in the saint's life as we read through the Bible. But again, you always want to be careful to remember, God's never done writing your story. If you're here breathing here today you're sitting in this pew and you're taking in his air and breathing it out there's still a part of your story that's not done right now you may be like Joseph sitting in that cell thinking about your family saying God why did my family turn my back on me why did they leave me to go off in Egypt fend for myself and now he's in prison in a strange land in a strange language having no friends no family that's a bad predicament but you know what? Joseph's story wasn't over yet. There was still a lot God was going to do for him. And you know what? Right now you may be right in that predicament. But always have hope that God has something for you that is going to change your life. God doesn't waste any trial. 
It's not an accident that something comes up in your life and he, oh man, I'm sorry, I turned my back and now you're in trouble. That's not what happens with God. God purposely places things in your life with precision, not to break you down, but to strengthen you. He allows that to happen. You think of the story of Job. What a tragedy. What a, what a predicament that, that he was in. Lost all his family. Lost all his goods. You'd get depressed. I mean, I, I don't think anybody here would be able to do what Job did. Job heard the news of all that taking place, and what did he do? He fell down on his face, and he worshiped God, even with losing all his family and all his positions. And that's something that, that you see there with Job, but you know what? Job's story wasn't over. He ended up at the end of his life getting those family back and then getting twice as much as he had before. You know what? The lesson is to trust in God. Not keep your focus on the predicament you're in, but look to God and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand it. You may not even agree with it, but you trust in Him anyways. And He's going to bring it out better than you could ever imagine. Now, I'm not saying that it's not going to hurt. That's the thing you see there with Paul. Paul had some pain there. Paul had some pain. That definitely hurt Paul. And it's something that stuck in his mind. If you look over to 2 Corinthians, look over to 2 Corinthians, I think, uh, I think Paul is kind of one of those super Christians. I don't know if you ever read about Paul and he's saying, whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Where is he writing that from? From a prison for doing basically what you're doing here tonight. I, I think our attitude may be different. If the police all of a sudden busted through the door and started arresting us and hauling us off the jail, throwing us in jail just because we came to church tonight, I'd probably get a little bitter with God. I'd probably get a little bit upset. But Paul's saying, whatsoever state I am, they're with to be content. But you know what? There was something in his life early on in his ministry. And I think if we can focus in on that, we can see why Paul was content in these trials. Because he remembered one time early in his Christian life that he got let down. And God did some things in his life that opened up his eyes to say, you know what, God's not through with me yet. I need to remember that time I was let down and what God did with it. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11 there. Paul is going through uh, it's a familiar passage to you probably, but he's addressing people and telling them about his ministry and if you read down through there, about verse uh, 23, you notice Paul's ministry was just full of hardship, full of trials. He says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck a night and a day have I been, I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painful, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, and cold and naked, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul is giving you a list of trials. He's giving you kind of the contrary to a prosperity gospel preacher. You go serve God and guess what's going to happen? The devil's not going to like it. And you're going to see a little bit of suffering. But you know what Paul says, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, when God sends suffering and, and trials in your life, it's an opportunity to glorify God more than just by simple benefit that He gives to us. And that's what Paul sees. But you know what? what? What was in his mind when he was going through that? Well, the passage we looked at. Look back to uh, verse 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory in, of the things which concerning my infirmities... The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Arturus, the king kept the city of Damascus, 
and the garrison desires to apprehend me. And through a window in the basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hand. Paul finished a list of trials and troubles and suffering and all this stuff he went to. One thing stuck in his mind that brought back her memory. He said, all that stuff happened, but you know what? I'm going to glory in the Lord because I remember one time I was let down. There was a time way back there when just I was a baby Christian. I was new in Christ. Everything fell apart and I was let down. For some reason, that was an encouragement. You say, why was that an encouragement? God had some providence there. God had some providence there. You say, what was the providence? Well, there were some things going on in his life that the Lord allowed to happen. The first thing he noticed is God always provides a way. There was a basket there already ready for him to be lowered down the wall. He provides a way every time. Somewhere in your life, there's going to be a basket there in that trial that God's going to let you down in that basket. And if, not, if you're not careful, instead of saying, Lord, you provided this way out of this trial. Instead, you'll get bitter at God. Why did you put me in the trial? Instead of realizing God's the one that helps you out of it and gets you through. You're not going to eliminate trials from your life. There's no way possible to do that. But you know what? If you can do it all by his hand... That's a blessing. He also provides a, when the doors get shut, there was no way for Paul to get out that gate. No way at all. But you know what the Lord did? The Lord already had a window designed there in that wall that he could be let in. You know what? God's already got plans far ahead of you. He's going to provide a way. Paul remembered that. He said, you know what? Man shut the gate, but God opened the window somewhere that I could get through. Uh, I just heard a, a request from a church here this morning. They were talking about getting an air conditioning. They were talking about how God's provided for them to get this air conditioning. It would cost them usually $30,000, but now they have an inside with a man that's going to give them at half price and then put it in for free for $4,500. I'm like, that's, that's a great blessing. And I think about this story. Uh, I was at a church down in South Florida where the Lord really used this small little place called Pahokee. And there was a, there's a minister there that he had offered up his church grounds there. He, the, the church was right up on the, the levee there. There's a Lake Okeechobee and there's a, a levee that comes up right behind the church. And he told the construction company they could park their vehicles there and you know, use it to, to work on the levee. Well, during the course of events, they had an air conditioner about 35 years old and you know, the, the man that was running the construction company told him, you know, if you let us use this parking lot, we'll come in and repave your whole parking lot if you'll just let us use it. Well, he was excited with that. That's a blessing from God just, just for that. Well, during the course of that, somebody had came in and stole all the air conditioners they had. And so now they are down there in South Florida, wet, humid, hot, boiling heat, no money to pay for their air conditioners, thousands of dollars to pay for it. And he was walking around, looking around the back of the church, and here comes that construction man again. And he says, what, what's going on? What happened to your air conditioners? He said, I think somebody broke in and stole them. He said, you know what, that was probably somebody from our crew. You wait just a second, I'll be right back. Went back, wrote him a check to pay for all brand new air conditioners in his church building, and gave it to him. You say, what was that? That was somebody getting let down. Somebody getting let down, but... You didn't know it behind the scenes. God was providing a way. God was providing some good for him, even in the midst of being let down. That's what the Lord does. But you also know what? Paul didn't let himself down. Paul didn't lower himself down off the edge of the wall. You know what there was? There were some brethren up there holding the ropes. Yeah. And you know what? That's a reminder when you get in a low point. The devil wants you to focus on somebody that may have hurt you here. But you know what? I guarantee you there's several people that love you. Amen. And when you're getting let down, they want to help you. Yeah. And you know what? Paul was reminded of the time he was getting let down that there were some brethren holding the ropes, helping them out, being where they should have been. And there were some brethren that focused more on the will of God than they focused on their own desire. Who were they letting down? They were letting down one that not only weeks ago probably was a persecutor. I would almost be, be uh, 
a betting man and say, you know what, I probably think that maybe one of the people holding the ropes was probably related to somebody Paul had persecuted. You know what that showed? That showed Paul, if those people can have that much grace to somebody like me, I think I can have some grace with somebody else. You know what, being let down for Paul wasn't a sad thing. It was showing him how God works in these situations far more than he can imagine. But you know what, none of that would have happened if he was never let down. And you know what, that's what the, the message tonight for you hopefully is that when you're in the middle of getting let down, maybe consider that. Maybe consider that God's doing something that you don't see. Maybe God's given you some protection that you're not aware of. And I, the Lord reminds me of that constantly, constantly reminded me of that about, you know what, I'm not in my own ministry. This is not my job. It's not my ministry. It's His work. He's the one that directs my path if I'm leaning on Him. And I think about that. We were, uh, we were trying to get to a meeting in Ohio and I had scheduled it for a, a whole mission conference from Monday to Wednesday. And just for some reason, we could not get down there on, on the Sunday. And I was a little bit bitter. We couldn't work the meeting out. Kind of frustrated with the Lord that he wouldn't let us be there on Sunday. And um, just really getting in the flesh. Well, we leave out of Wisconsin. We drive down to Ohio. We drive through the night, Sunday night. We get there Monday morning. Uh, about 10 o'clock and we're pulling into the town that I was trying to get to. And as we pull in, we start noticing there's debris all up and down the roadway. And there's police cars blocking the intersection and all the lights are flashing, all the lights and all the buildings were down. Um, we looked across the highway and there was a, a big uh, Lowe's parking lot where the roof was just peeled off the top and laying in the parking lot. There was a Dollar General across the street from us that was leveled flat. And we pulled up to one person to ask him, you know, what was, what's going on in this place? He said, well, there was a tornado that came through at 6 o'clock yesterday. And I stopped and realized, you know what, that's where I wanted to be. But God let me down. He let me down to protect me. And you know what, some things in your life that God's doing, He's doing for your own good. You may not see it right now. You may not know why He's doing it. One day the Lord will show you, you may get the blessing of knowing now, but you know what? God, when he lets you down, it's always for a purpose. It's always for a good thing. And you know what? If you're like Paul, you'll remember that time and it'll be an encouragement to you through your whole life. And it'll help you get through other trials, other troubles. And that's like it did with Paul there. So consider those things tonight and let's uh, go ahead and close here in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be with these folks. And the, the blessing it is to know that you're in control. And there's nothing we can do in spite of you. There's nothing we can do outside your control, Lord. And pray you'd just be with us. Help us to yield to you. Help us not to, to lean to our own understanding, especially in these things, Lord, when we, we know we are getting let down and we're getting discouraged and getting weary in the way. Lord, I pray you'd help these people, especially not to be weary and well-doing, because you promised in due season they'll reap if they faint not. Lord, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for your hand of protection. Thank you for your hand of uh, provision. Lord, I pray you'd uh, allow all of us to see that throughout this week and the rest of our life, you allow us to serve you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.